I'm Anne-Marie Gillen, a proud PGA member and a co-founder of the Social Impact Entertainment Task Force. And welcome to the UN and PGA Task Force second in a series of virtual workshops for the creative community to explore the possibilities of collaborations to make positive social impact entertainment. And the focus of this particular workshop is climate crisis and the power of storytelling. Uh, to start off, I'd like to show you a short clip and let me introduce Mary Jo Winkler. She's a film and TV producer and co-founder of PGA Green and the Green Production Guide. She'll say a few words. Hello, my name is Mary Jo Winkler. I am one of the co-founders of PGA Green. We are pleased that the PGA and the UN have gathered for this event, acknowledging World Television Day to discuss how the film and television industry can work with the UN to inspire action to address the climate crisis. The Producers Guild and PGA Green have been promoting sustainability for over a decade with a long-standing partnership with the Studio Production Alliance, which now includes 11 major studios and production company partners. Our joint initiative, greenproductionguide.com, offers resources and tools to calculate carbon emissions on film and television sets. We have recently added COVID-19 return to work guidelines, acknowledging the connection between climate change, the pandemic, and inequalities. In addition, we produce SEEDS, a sustainable environment education series, promoting conversations about climate awareness, sustainability, and storytelling in our industry. We have proven that our initiatives have an impact. They save money, divert waste from the landfills, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and support our communities while making great films and television shows in the process. We invite you all to use our resources and learn more about what we are doing at greenproductionguide.com. Thank you. Back in 2011, uh, reaching out to writers, directors, and producers, then Secretary General Ban Ki-moon swept into Los Angeles pitching, quote, I need your support. You have the power and influence to send to millions and billions of people around the world. Together we can have a blockbuster impact on the world, end quote. Well, we really need a blockbuster impact on the world with climate crisis. And the main goal with this event is to inspire and empower all you creatives to take on this issue in your entertainment projects. There is such a delicate balance showcasing the horrific results of this crisis, but somehow tempering it with hope and solutions. We're honored today to have powerful lineup of legendary and renowned guest speakers from our national treasure, Norman Lear and Lynn Davis Lear to writer, director, producers, the passionate visionaries that have worked on Chernobyl, The Handmaid's Tale, Cove, Chasing Ice to the top UN personnel on the worldwide leading edge of this climate issue. At the end, we're saving about 20 minutes for Q&A. So if you have questions as we go, just click your Q&A button below and put them there. So without further ado, I would like to hand it over to, uh, for the UN introduction to Maher Nasser, Director of Outreach Division, UN Department of Global Communication. Thank you. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Good morning. Good afternoon to all. Uh, I'm happy to welcome you all on behalf of the United Nations to the second United Nations PGA workshop. Special thanks to our collaborator, the Producers Guild of America, and all speakers and guests today. Thanks, of course, to all of you for giving time on your weekend, especially when the weather is as beautiful as it is today in Los Angeles and New York. We timed the workshop today not to spoil your weekend and take you away from the good weather, but to mark World Television Day, which is celebrated on the 21st of November each year, which is next Saturday. The United Nations General Assembly established World TV Day in the middle of 1990s to recognize the influence of television and film content. It ha has on the attitudes and behaviors of its viewers and the attention it brings to a broad range of social, economic, environmental, and political issues. Growing up in a small town in the Middle East, television was my window to the world, and in many ways, my classroom. That's how I learned my English. There's extraordinary creative talent here today that will share with us how they incorporate issues into their storytelling work. A number of my UN colleagues are also here today to share information as we at the United Nations want to help you tell impactful stories 
on global issues to create empathy and change action. That was why Ban Ki-moon came here in 2011 and I was with him on that trip and have been involved in this exercise since then. One way we do this is by helping connect writers, directors and productions to experts on every important issue facing the world today. And that brings us to our focus today, the climate emergency crisis, call it as you want. When we held our first workshop with PGA on the 22nd of August, I remember that California fires were raging, a stark reminder of the impact of climate change, droughts and fires in one part of the world, floods, typhoons and hurricanes in another. As I suspect, you all know it, it's real and it needs your urgent help. Tackling the impact of climate change is one of the 17 sustainable development goals. A call to action by all countries, world leaders adopted those at the United Nations on the 25th of September, 2015. They were adopted to promote prosperity while protecting the planet. They are goals the world has pledged to achieve in the next 10 years by launching a decade of action to implement them by the year 2030. If we do not solve the climate crisis, the other goals for people and the planet may become meaningless. The goals about ending poverty, eradicating hunger, achieving gender equality, access to water, sanitation, and so on and so forth. But coming back to the climate, to tell you more about the crisis and the state of the planet is our colleague, Cassie Flynn. Cassie is one of the foremost climate experts at the United Nations. She is the strategic advisor on climate change to the head of the United Nations Development Program. And she's also the former advisor to the Prime Minister of Fiji. Casey also head of the UNDP Climate Promise, the world's largest offer to support of support under the Paris Agreement in 115 countries. Cassie, I turn this over to you. Thank you so very much, Maha. And it is such a pleasure to, to be here and to be with all of you. Um, a lot of gratitude uh, to Anne-Marie, Diana, the PGA team, Carlos, Andy, um, everyone that has made this, this event possible. I must admit, I'm, I'm a bit starstruck with, with this lineup and uh, with the, the list of participants. Um, in my role at, at the United Nations, I sit around a lot of tables advising various people on, on climate change. And because climate change is this global issue, the international treaty negotiations are often considered some of the most complicated in the world. And so around the tables, you often have world leaders from nearly 200 countries talking in six languages with the little earpiece uh, on and looking at some of the biggest and most pressing ways that climate change is touching every part of, of the global economy. Now, in, in these discussions, one word I hear a lot, and especially now, is unprecedented. Unprecedented. We hear that with climate impacts, we hear that with COVID, we hear it with the economic crisis. And for me, I must admit, I, 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 that word doesn't really cut it all the time. It sounds a bit sterile because when we're talking about something like climate change and we're talking about impacts that are unprecedented, it's very, very scary. We have gotten ourselves into an enormous mess and we really need to get ourselves out of it. And this is where I think all of you have a really, really important role to play, a unique role as storytellers, as creatives, as ways to be able to tell this story as we are living it in real time. And so today I really wanted to just touch very quickly on a few things. The first, I, I wanna talk about some of the stakes when it comes to climate change. What are we really looking at and the long-term impacts? And then I wanna talk a little bit about what the world is doing. Maha talked about the SDGs and I wanna share a little bit more about what those mean along with the Paris Agreement. And then talking about you and how we need your help. We need your help to nourish our humanity in this moment and to help us to understand climate change in new ways and also be able to see a future that even just a few years ago, maybe really didn't even seem possible. 
So first, mistakes. Climate change is one of these things that people have a hard time wrapping their head around because we hear about impacts that are so big and we hear about category five storms, we hear about sea level rise, we hear about drought, we hear about the wildfires that are raging most recently in California and in Australia before that. But sometimes we don't really have a moment to process really what that means. And that, for example, when we were talking about sea level rise, we know that 75% of the world's megacities are on coastlines. And that means hundreds of millions of people needing to potentially move. And what are the implications of that? When we think about drought, we often you know, think about sort of, you know, big croplands sort of drying up. And we don't necessarily think about what that means for the things that are on our plate at that moment. The things that we're so familiar with, salmon, chocolate, guacamole, uh, wine, all of these are going to be dramatically impacted by climate change and our ability to have them is going to change. And then we have some of these ways that climate change is really affecting the world in a humanitarian crisis. When we think about some of the major conflicts around the world, Yemen, Syria, and other places, we don't often think about the role that climate change has played in them. But for example, with Syria, when you, when you rewind far enough, the beginning of that story was really about a drought. And it was really about a drought that completely decimated the agricultural systems. All the farms pretty much went down at once. And not only did they have a food shortage, but a lot of people had to move from the rural areas into the cities. And this really was the first domino that tipped into the series of things that happened to lead to where we are right now. Climate change was a multiplier of many different insecurities and vulnerabilities that has now led to one of the greatest humanitarian crises in the world today. And so the stakes are high. And as we think about them, it's important to think about them from many different ways. But there is a global response. And this is where the Sustainable Development Goals and the Paris Agreement really come in. As I mentioned, I spend a lot of time sitting around these tables and these tables represent countries really trying to hash out what the heck we are going to do. And the Paris Agreement is this fantastic way that we can really come together and start to make these choices as countries and as a world to really keep global temperature rise at a level that keeps us safe. In the Paris Agreement, we talk a lot about this magical number, this 1.5 degrees. And 1.5 degrees really represents the place that keeps us safe. And right now, we're at about 1.1 degrees. We are 0.4 degrees away from that threshold. And we have to take action now collectively in order to tackle this problem. So that brings me to you, storytellers. You have a unique moment in this. Because as I mentioned, this word unprecedented, it doesn't, it just doesn't cut it. When it comes to the climate crisis, there is so much fear, there is anxiety, and there is hope, and there is joy, and there are ways that we are innovating that we have never seen before. And as storytellers, your ability to capture that is a way that can help all of us to understand more of what's going on and to be able to imagine a future. So I get, I get asked a lot, what are things that uh, I wish storytellers would be able to, to say in some, of their, in some of their work? And so I'm, I'm going to give you three today. Um, and the first is about science. Right now, we are seeing a real, uh, a real war against science. We're seeing science continually being sort of disrespected and, and real decades of work starting to be undercut. Uh, because of various reasons around the world that uh, really don't help us move forward. And I think being able to portray science in your work in a way that celebrates it, in a way that makes it accessible and understandable, I think is something that is really, really important. 
The second thing is that climate change really is a global issue. One country can't do it alone. And as much as right now we hear a lot about countries sort of wanting to put themselves first, it is a matter of a global solution that requires multilateralism in a way that we all need to be supportive of. And being able to portray that, being able to portray the reality of that is something that is very important. And the third and the most important is hope. It is so important because this crisis is scary that we can demonstrate a whole new way forward. We can start to think about what are the things that seemed impossible just a few years ago that now can launch us into an entirely new era. And you as storytellers can help us to imagine that. You can help us to imagine what it looks like to have new types of buildings that are uh, going to help tackle the climate crisis, new ways of travel, new ways of thinking about how we're going to live our lives that help to protect the planet and to protect ourselves. I think you can also help us to be able to imagine this future and imagine ourselves in it in an entirely new way. And in a way that helps us to connect to this climate crisis and to wrap our heads around it so that we can all feel like that not just that we are uh, sort of victims of this or bystanders of it, but instead that we can be heroes. We can be the ones that get ourselves out of this mess. So with that, I just want to say thank you so very much for having me. And I really look forward to this conversation today. And I do hope that this is the beginning of a, of a conversation that we can have uh, over, over the months and years as you are developing projects um, in partnership uh, with, with the many partners that you have as well as the United Nations. So thank you so much. Maha, over to you. Thank, thank you so much, Cassie. And as a reminder, uh, and I see some questions are, are being addressed to Cassie, there will be a Q&A at the end. So just after the session with the documentary filmmakers, uh, Cassie will be there to answer your questions, uh, especially on climate change, and, and we will be there for others. It is now my great honor and privilege to welcome Lynn and Norman Lear. And I'm sure you don't need me to tell you about Norman's legacy and television career and his pioneering work in, in social activism. Uh, I had the pleasure of meeting both of them in their house in 2014, uh, while we were planning the first climate summit for Second General Ban Ki-moon and, uh, and another time in 2016 when we came back with the Secretary General and of course I saw them at the United Nations. Uh, so good to see you uh, even though this time across thousands of miles using technology. Great to uh, see. Norman, <laughs> thank you. Norman has famously uh, been making popular entertainment which has impacted the public's views on race, gender issues, sexuality, and much, much more since the 1970s. Lynn similarly has been at the forefront of social change with her environmental activism since the mid 1980s. And congratulations to both of you who are nominated for Emmys this year. It will be no surprise to you that Norman broke his own record of being the oldest person to win an Emmy. Together, Lynn and Norman also founded Hollywood Health and Society, which celebrates its 20th anniversary this year. It has become the go-to organization for writers and producers looking for expert insight on storytelling and storylines related to health, safety, and security. And it is exactly the example set by health, Hollywood Health and Society that we at the United Nations created the Creative Community Outreach Initiative to offer a window into the United Nations that can help connect experts, as we saw now on climate crisis, humanitarian and others with creatives such as the audience of this workshop. Lynn, and Norman, thank you so much for taking the time on your demanding schedule to join us on a Saturday to discuss the importance of issue-based storytelling. I'd like to start maybe with, with Lynn. 
I think we first, as I, as I mentioned, we met in 2014 when you helped the UN produce the short film, What's Possible for the UN Climate Summit uh, in September of that year. It was played in the UN General Assembly Hall for world leaders and was seen by millions worldwide. How did you get started in environmental activism and advocacy through filmmaking? And what it's important to note that with this, I know this was started even before the internet. So if you can tell us a little bit about that. Well, we, um, uh, Hollywood Health and Society had launched by having Bill McKibben come to our home and speak. And even though we had been involved in environmental work for many, many years, it was a real wake up call for me when Bill spoke about climate. And I think he had just started his um, uh, divestment campaign around college campuses. And I just was blown away by uh, this call for climate uh, justice and do to work on climate change uh, around the world. So just being in, um, you know, uh, what do you call it a nester? Uh, my kids had just gone away to school uh, to college, uh, I, I wanted to do something to help that. And I heard that the UN needed an opening film and I thought, well, I can do that. I, I knew nothing about filmmaking at the time. And, um, but it was a, a real learning experience and um, it was a joy and, and a, a great opportunity and well, a lot to, of fun. Tell them about uh, your pregnancy and, and you and Cindy Horn. Oh, that okay. was years before. Well, that, but was, that in was the start of your. <laughs> well, that was in the in the late eighties when Cindy Horn, who's married to Alan Horn, and I were pregnant together and really worried about what the environment was going to be like in thirty years, and uh, became interested in in um, in starting an environmental organization called Emma, uh, and I think Debbie is is with us who who. Does a magnificent job running it now, um, but this was like in the this was in 2014 when uh, Ban Ki Moon had just decided uh, to have a climate summit for all the world leaders uh, before the uh, Paris summit the year before, mm -hmm. and uh, so we made this opening film, which was uh, a wonderful experience. Difficult, but wonderful. No, th thank, thank you again for that. Uh, I remember seeing it from inside the General Assembly Hall uh, and the looking at people's faces and the wonder and amazement that uh, images and, and music and voice can make. Uh, do you feel, do you think that the film had the impact that you had hoped it would have inside the room and later? We knew that Ban Ki-moon wanted something positive and uplifting for these world leaders to feel that there was hope for the environment. So we got Scotty Burns to write the script and Louis Schwartzberg to do the cinematography and Morgan Friedman to do the voiceover and, and then um, uh, Hans Zimmer to do the music. So I don't think you can do much better than that. So the group of those people working together made a, a very hopeful uplifting film that uh, still works today. Um, about how and, and it was definitely. Pardon me. No, no, go ahead. No, it's it's about where we want to be, where the world could be, and where we hope mm -hmm. to be. Thank you very much, and I think we still aren't there. Mm -hmm. uh, Norman, uh, yes, a year sir. later, you and Len invited the Secretary General to your and 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 the team. I was there uh, to your home. To talk about uh, to talk to a group of showrunners uh, on the hope of inspiring support for sustainable development goals and climate change through their storytelling. Uh, your whole career has been devoted to creating groundbreaking television and spearheading initiatives that fight against bigotry and stand for sustainability, democracy, and dignity for everybody. What? has it been so important to you personally to include social messaging and advocacy in entertainment? Well, every, everything I've done has been uh, working in turn with families. 
you know, from All in the Family and Maude, that each of these individual shows, Good Times and The Jeffersons, they were about families. Uh, I obviously grew up in a family. I understood the relationship of fathers and sons and daughters and mothers and so forth, and uh, found the best stories, uh, relatable stories to a wide audience uh, in those relationships and the problems they faced uh, in the culture and the society and with each other. So that's basically where uh, all of the initiative, story initiatives uh, derived of. So to many people, you're an idol uh, and, and uh, a wizard of sorts in turning issues uh, into compelling content. Can you give some hints and tricks to people who are joining us? I'm sorry, I didn't know that. Do I have some tips? <laughs> what, is, what is the trick? What is the trick that you have in turning issues into compelling content that is entertaining at the same time I impactful and, and, and changing. There is this incident in my life that was immeasurably uh, helpful. My father got into trouble when I was nine years old and he was sent away for three years. Uh, the uh, evening after the police took him, uh, my mother was ashamed and couldn't live in the same place and we were moving uh, I was destined to go live with my grandparents, but in any event, she was selling the furniture that night. There was a stranger in the, uh, in the house looking at my father's red leather chair in which we sat to watch, uh, to listen to radio, uh, <laughs> the uh, Friday night fights and so forth. It was a very meaningful piece of furniture to me. Anyway, this guy was going to buy it and he sees me and understands my situation, puts his hand on my shoulder and says, well, Norman, you're the man of the house now. You turn to a nine-year-old in that situation and call him the man of the house. <laughs> Somehow, I understood the foolishness of that moment <laughs> and what I later termed the foolishness of the human condition. And I think it motivated everything that followed in my life career-wise. Finding the humor in it all. Yeah. Well, you can find humor even in the fact that uh, <laughs> we, we, we need this planet on which to survive. Uh, and we are the uh, creatures uh, that were, have been on our way to destroying it. <laughs> 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 no. No, thank you. Thank you for sharing that personal and, and moving story with us, uh, Norman. Uh, we just heard from Cassie. I'm not sure if you were uh, listening to the first part. Cassie, Lynn, our colleague from the UN Development Program, who spoke about the urgency of climate crisis and the need to respond in, in ways that go beyond what we have done so far, because we are not where we need to be. We are far behind. Uh, why do you think it is that people, corporations, and governments still need convincing, in spite of all the evidence uh, that we see? We see in California in the droughts and fires, we see in other parts of the world with the hurricanes and flooding, we see it. Why, why can't governments, corporations, <clears throat> heed the warning signs of science? Well, first of all, there have been huge, massive disinformation campaigns put out by oil, the oil industry and other industries that just, it's about greed and they just don't want people to believe this is a serious problem. And, um, and it's just so unfortunate that it, it always astonishes me that greed of that level can, can counteract reality and survival of the planet. Um, and I think we, as filmmakers and storytellers, have to do more. I'm on the board of Sundance, and it's astonishing also that there just aren't enough films that deal with the environment and certainly with climate. Um, 
uh, I've been working on a film on the California wildfires. Actually, it's, it's not about California anymore. It's about the international wildfires and climate change solutions to this problem. We are hoping to get into Sundance. We don't know. Um, but there are very few of these kinds of films that are being submitted to festivals that I know of. Uh, and we need more. And there's some brilliant filmmakers out there. Um, and some of them are going to be on today that have done a lot for environmental filmmaking. But we need more filmmakers to, to tackle these subjects. And get the right. Absolutely. I totally agree. No, I, I agree fully because one would think that there have been enough films about this, but we need we need more and we need films that also show the way out that, that have a, a, like you mentioned, the film that you did for the UN in, in 2014. You need to give people hope to motivate them to take action, because if it's all doom and gloom, then why should I care why it's it's happening? I did a film with Louis Schwartz, Schwartzberg after um, after the little UN film called Fantastic Fungi uh, that talks about mushrooms and, and mycelium and the whole underground, you know, magical world of, of fungi that helps pull carbon out of the atmosphere. <clears throat> and it's a, it's a really beautiful story and a film um, about how science, you know, not science, but about how nature creates, you know, this natural, um, ability to to solve our climate pro, uh, problem climate problems if we would only just listen to nature there are so many answers out there um, mm -hmm. I think we could do more of those kind of ones I mean I mean that's of course the role of documentaries and films that showcase the science can 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 one think of uh, Norman uh, of maybe sitcoms or uh, can we think of how can we increase can, can maybe creators think of ways to change in the same way smoking was taken out uh, in the same way that uh, LGBTQ issues became forefront and people accepted, you know, same sex marriage through shows that basically brought these issues to people's home. Is there a room to, to, to bring those issues through these shows and how, how can people, maybe filmmakers, TV produce, productions help convince people to to take concrete actions in, in this area. This is exactly, uh, you mentioned earlier, Hollywood Health and Society, which is part of a center that happens to carry our name at uh, USC. And uh, that center is there to advise uh, uh, writers, producers, and directors of television shows uh, to do stories uh, that uh, help understand, help the audience understand climate change and the things they can do to help it. Uh, you know, the obstacles in our lives, uh, are what the uh, society in, uh, in advises writers, producers, and directors to deal with. <clears throat> so we're deeply into the answer to that question. Mm -hmm. No, that's, that's, uh, I, and I remember I visited the Norman Lear Center and, and we, were, we were very impressed. And I think we take it to heart to see creative people such as yourselves dedicated to issues that are on the UN's agenda. Uh, yeah. Has what, anything what, what, that you have seen, any show or organization that is now taking big issues uh, impressed you uh, on climate or you still want to see something out there that one of our 100 and so listeners can, can, can try to take that challenge? We just watched the David Attenborough latest show on our planet that really beautiful from looking at all 50 years of his his storytelling that was quite touching and very and, and but talked about solutions also. Um, that's why this Bring Your Own Brigade, the wildfire film, is all about climate solutions because we have to have hope and we have to show. I mean, we have all the technology to be able to solve these problems. People have to know that, so they're not so afraid, so frightened. Uh, I'm glad Lynn thought of that. It's a uh, it's a marvelous film uh, for your audience, and uh, I'm so glad she called it to your attention. It covers the no, water. Love... No, we'd, we'd we'd love to know uh, more about bring your bring in your own brigade, uh, Lynn. When when will it be ready, and where can and when and how can we 
maybe help showcase it at the UN? Well, it was submitted to Sundance. We're waiting to hear if it's been accepted. And um, then we'll see, we'll go from there. We'll see. But Unfortunately, Lucy because of, sorry, go ahead. Now, Lucy Walker is a wonderful director. And mm. uh, so, you know, it's in good hands. I mean, as you know, we organize, we used to organize film screenings at the United Nations uh, and, and follow up with talkbacks with creators and, and producers, directors. Unfortunately, since COVID, uh, most of what we do now, we do virtually like, like what we're doing now. So we might think of a way to do something virtual uh, or once conditions allow, hopefully with this vaccine, things will be, I'm guessing not another year, but let's let's be more hopeful right right norman what what motivates you to keep making television uh and and what stories do you still want to tell well we uh the show we have on the air now one day at a time is about a uh, we've never done a show with a latin family and this uh, is a latinx group that is perfectly delicious starring rita moreno and Justina Machado. Uh, and uh, she, by the way, is a big hit on Dancing with the Stars right now. <laughs> uh, so we're having a great time with that. And these are family stories facing the problems we all face, in including uh, the climate and the health of our planet. Yes, the young teenage girl in one day at a time talks about climate and environment all the time. So that's another way of, of bringing these issues into, into television storytelling and you, as you said, sitcoms. So you can have a character who's, you know, like a child who's really interested in, in the environment, for instance, and fights with his or her parents about, you know, why aren't we doing more? Or, I mean, you can bring in environmental issues in, very, in many different ways. Into, into storytelling. Mm -hmm. uh, no, absolutely. Uh, really, thank you both for, for your time. Uh, heartful thank you to Norman uh, Lear, Lynn Davis Lear for your time today, uh, your insights on storytelling and the lifelong commitment to bringing about change is, is really moving. And for us, another sign of hope. You mentioned David Attenborough's film. It is the one that I have been recommending to every person I know. Uh, the first, and I say, forget about the first two thirds, don't get sucked into that because you might feel there is no hope. Wait until the ending because that's where he offers the solutions. But he makes a great case for the challenge, for the crisis that we're facing. And, and I think rewilding the wild has become the call in my head. We have to go back and return the natural world, its wonder uh, and, and, and maybe allow it to once again try to make up for the mistakes we have made. I would like to thank you again uh, and turn over to Debbie Levin, uh, CEO of the Environmental Media Association. Uh, Debbie will moderate the first of the two panels that, that we have uh, to go and take in-depth look into successful issue-based television shows and films. Once again, Lynn and Norman, thank you very much and over to you, Debbie. Thank you so much. And Lynn and Norman, amazing to see you both. Um, we have an amazing panel. We have a great panel, so I want to get started right away. Uh, Craig Mazin is with us. Craig, are you, you're on. And so Craig Mazin is the Golden Globe and two-time Emmy and Emma award-winning winning writer and producer of the HBO series Chernobyl, also winning a Writers Guild Award and a Producers Guild Award for that. Dorothy Fortenberry is co-executive producer and writer of The Handmaid's Tale. Um, and Andy Gitau is a two-time Emmy award-winning journalist and filmmaker, as well as a strategic communication expert who is currently heading advocacy and the entertainment industry engagement at the United Nations Department of Global Communications. This is why I had to read that, because it's a lot, because you guys are amazing. Um, thank you so much for being here today. And we've got a lot that we want to talk about. Um, I would love to jump in with Craig because I'm actually so interested, Craig, in why you chose the project Chernobyl 
we, you, you definitely have a long history of comedy <laughs> and this is quite the departure for you. Um, and I'm wondering if this was something that you were seeking out and you wanted to tell a story that really spoke to the human condition and climate change. So. Um, well, first of all, I just want to acknowledge once again, Dorothy and I are in the same virtual space. We always are. We like to be <clears throat> together in our weird brick rooms. One long brick wall. What just, you it's, that stretches across the United States. So it's <laughs> good to see you again. Um, <laughs> um, I did not. Uh, go uh, looking for something to comment on climate change or comment on anything. Um, what I generally have always done is just read things that are interesting to me. And while I've worked in comedy for a long time, you know, we're all different people. You know, I mean, look at what Norman has done, for instance. And and you know, he comes out of comedy, but he's obviously a very serious person who has serious interests and thoughts. Um, but when I started reading about what happened at Chernobyl and specifically why it happened and what happened following the actual explosion. Um, the part of me that has always been fascinated by truth and denial of truth was stimulated. And I actually believe that anybody that is works in comedy has this already inherently in them. I mean, the whole point of comedy is to point out the absurdity of everything. And nothing is funnier than pompous people who lie. And so it was actually, I don't see it as a departure. That's the weird thing. I mean, I don't see it as a departure mostly because it was all in my head anyway. I mean, it was like, I live here. So it didn't seem like I was going anywhere. I, I just was doing a different kind of thing. Um, but as I dug in and worked on it more and more and researched more and more, it did seem like that Chernobyl uh, became a kind of Swiss army knife of metaphor for what we are constantly struggling with, constantly. It doesn't, it's not about climate. It's not about the Trump administration. It's not about any kind of denialism. It's about all of it because it's all related. I mean, everything that we see right now in terms of our struggle with the truth and the war on the truth and our inability to handle it, even when it's staring us in the face, even when it kills us, that's that's that the flaw in the human condition that it fascinates me the most. And I think that's ultimately what Chernobyl uh, illustrated most clearly to me as I was reading. It's so weird how timely it is in terms of denial and denial. Like I, I, I'm assuming that you've been de you developed this for a while and obviously well before we were, we were in this situation, but um, the timing of it couldn't have been more um, impactful, I think. Um, right. in Russia, um, you, you got to meet survivors, you got to meet a lot of deniers. And I think just being in, being there, can you just talk a bit about that experience and maybe on a personal level, how that affected you actually being there during shooting? Well, uh, it certainly drives home the nature of the human community. We tend to think of the human community as uh, in a positive sense, uh, that we uh, once you get past borders and religions and race, you find that we all share all these wonderful things in common, like we love our children and we hope for a better future. But I would also put forth that there are other things that unite us all, like our need to deny difficult truths, <laughs> which is just common across the world. And it is fascinating to see how people handle and process these things. Um, they often come at it from a place of pride. Um, sometimes they're angry that you're the one telling the story and they're not telling the story. Um, there are people who politically are motivated to suggest that it wasn't as bad as you say. There are people who are politically motivated to suggest it was worse. And you will be criticized in all sorts of ways because people have entrenched interests in their own personal uh, experience with it. They want to feel good. I mean, we are, uh, all of us, adults, large babies. Uh, we started wanting to feel good. We continue to want to feel good. We continue to cry and scream until we get our pacifier. And 
Um, there are people who outgrow it and there are people who look soberly upon things and analyze them fairly and judiciously, even if it is not to their own benefit. Those are rarer people I find. Um, but I will say overall that in Eastern Europe, the people who I worked with and listened to were remarkable. And I would suggest that people who survived the Soviet Union came out on the other side, which uh, most of our crew, for instance, in Lithuania, that would apply to. They have a better perspective on this. They have seen where it all goes. Uh, and I think in the West, we are sometimes uh, willfully ignorant as to the end result of denial. Um, and what is shocking to me is that it doesn't seem like some of the things that I would think would be circuit breakers on that have fit, have changed anything. Quarter of a million people just died. A lot of people don't care. Uh, I don't I don't know what to say to that. That's new. I'm 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 absorbing that. I'm trying to make sense of it. It's so hard to even absorb that though. And I think in to your point, Chernobyl is as as you chose it because it was compelling and it moved you, it sort of represents the global issue of of global denial that that we have. And whether that is for a pandemic or whether it's for climate change, this is this is something that I don't think I've ever experienced to this extent in my lifetime. Well, we've all been we've all been living with it without knowing it. Yeah, I right. mean, the vast majority of people on the planet believe in God, which I would I don't care. I'll just say is a form of denial. <laughs> we think that there's someone up there. There isn't. Um, people believe in life after death. Uh, almost certainly, that does not exist either. 80% uh, of Americans believe in angels. There are no angels. Uh, this is a problem on the left and the right. There are people on the left who uh, are afraid of vaccines. There are people on the left who believe that crystals will help them get through the day. There are people on the left who believe in pet psychics. Uh, and there are people on the right who think that wearing a mask doesn't matter. And that if you are, I think to quote one woman I saw on television, if you are covered in Jesus's blood, you are immune. We are <laughs> all of us uh, <laughs> all over the place living with these kinds of fantastic thoughts. And it is uh, probably impossible to divorce humanity from all of its delusions, but this is not new. And the there's a kind of like a low level of delusion that I think we need just to get through the day. And the trick is how to not let other people come along and rise that tide on us, which is what demagogues do. It's what systems do. It's what entrenched powers do. And um, all of this has turned to what we used to think of as Soviet propaganda. Uh, we, we ourselves are constantly soaking in propaganda. We just call it advertising or talking points or platforms. Um, uh, we, are, we are all of us now drenched in the over narrativization of our lives. Everything is a story. Everything has an angle. Um, and we are beating each other to death with this stuff. And um, I'm not sure how to get out of it other than to say that as um, artists, I think maybe all we can do is continually hold the mirror up to the outrageousness of it. And occasionally, hopefully people will watch this and say, okay, that actually, you got me on that one. That reminds me of me. And now that I'm seeing somebody else doing it, I can see it's wrong. And hopefully uh, it's dangerous. Behavior change. Yeah. Right. Um, thank you. Jumping over to Dorothy for a bit. Um, the since the series that I'm obsessed with um, was was adapted from the 1985 Margaret Atwood novel, where climate issues were definitely seen through a different lens. Um, however, updating the story to the is it the near future? I think it's the near future that we're or the I, you know, not sure, um, but how much of a cautionary tale for climate change are you consistently able to address? Yeah, so just, it's not, it's not a future, it's an alternate present. So it's sort of, we were, we were chugging along and then we, we branched off at one point, but there- Mostly we want it to be future because we don't, we can't even do it. 
<laughs> no, there's no flying cars. Um, nobody has, you know, any, there's no tech in that world that is um, beyond the realm of, of things that we have. So it's not, it's not science fiction in, in, a, in a futuristic sense. It's just sort of a, a different present. Um, yeah. I mean, I think when we sat down in 2016 to work on the, the adaptation at the very beginning, um, we looked at the novel and the, the sequence of events in the novel was very clear. There was environmental devastation, which led to a fertility collapse, which led to a political collapse, um, which led to the rise of sort of religious fascism um, and a return to traditional values as a way to solve a problem. Um, and what we decided to do was take seriously that there was a real problem, um, that these, these kinds of solutions don't emerge in a vacuum, um, and that the environmental challenges of right now, especially around climate, um, can have fertility consequences, um, that the idea that our current uh, environmental world could create a situation in which all over the globe, um, people were having a hard time having children and, you know, governments, because of all kinds of reasons, were slow or inept to respond. People felt, a, a, a critical mass of people felt sufficiently uh, animated by this, um, bolstered by a religious background, that they were able to take over the government um, and then institute their version of solving the problem. Um, and something we always took really seriously was that the people of Gilead, the leaders, the commanders are fixing it. Like there is not the sound of car motors in Gilead because they are all running EVs. Um, you know, they, we, you drive past solar arrays. Um, they have organic food. They are trying to purify the water. Um, there are no plastics in those um, sun dappled kitchens. Uh, that, you know, it, it should look like, you know, it's not a fantasy world. <laughs> it's not something that I'm hopeful for, but they are taking the problem seriously and solving it. Um, and that really, that really mattered. Um, I want to quickly show a clip because I was wanted you to sort of set it up first um, about exactly what you're talking about. If you guys could run the clip for a sec. I have to tell you, this clip is even more uncomfortable because of the positive things that it's saying about the environment in that setting. And I remember distinctly watching it in the episode. And first of all, of course, writing it down and saying, okay, we have to make this an Emma Award um, nominee, but it was so beautifully and clearly illustrated. How do you sort of reconcile with the horrific world that's been created with the respect for natural resources. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm gonna say this partly just to piss Craig off uh, <laughs> on the other end of the brick wall. Um, I'm a really religious person. Um, so I come at my climate convictions and my sort of climate attitudes um, from a religious background. I go to church every week, like it's a big part of my life. Um, so working on The Handmaid's Tale is super interesting personally for me. Um, and when I wrote that scene, I basically drew on, you know, the parable of the sower, all, all kinds of stuff in scripture that I find really meaningful as an environmentalist. And then I was putting it in the mouth of somebody who is, you know, torturing these young women. Um, and that's where I feel like I, you know, make my most interesting work um, is, is not giving all the good lines to the good guys and all the bad lines to the bad guys, you know, like the bad guys have a lot of ammo. Um, they have a lot of insight. They have a lot of intellect. Um, you know, they are very good at what they do. And I think we underestimate them at our peril. Um, so for me to, as a religious person who's very passionate about climate issues, write a speech that was basically like the speech I would want to write, but then in the worst possible context, um, Th that's how I've approached the whole show, you know, is is it sort of a, a best case, worst case scenario for me um, as a person. I was it's supposed so to be bad. pissing you off. I don't understand why you would think that. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have a, an arm wrestle later and establish it's whether or not God exists. It'll be totally conclusive. You guys reach on my thing, you're like on opposite places. So. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, Andy, I just wanted to ask a couple of questions. Andy, with all your experience as an advocate and a journalist um, and filmmaker for humanitarian issues, how do you deal? How do you deal with the insanity of consulting for a show like this, which Dorothy was just saying is just literally a constant contradiction? Um, well, first of all, I have to say I'm very envious that I don't have a brick background. Um, but I will, say, you know, it's it's interesting because you use the word, um, you know, insanity, and I think sometimes there's there's nothing more insane than than real life and, and reality. And I think the thing that always amazed me about The Handmaid's Tale was the fact that there's not one thing ever mentioned in the book um, or in the series that hasn't happened somewhere in real life, somewhere in the world at some point in real life. So the insanity of, of real life. I mean, look, you know, I'm gonna sound incredibly corny, but it is like, it is one of the greatest privileges to, to work on that show um, specifically for the content itself, for the issues covered from climate, environment, refugee, women's issues, but also because of the unbelievable integrity of the writing staff and from the showrunner to the executives to the writers about getting the stories right and the authenticity at the end of the day it's not a documentary it's a piece of entertainment an extraordinary piece of entertainment but it is the notion of the the research and the details and the questions and the curiosity about what would any one event or emotion or scene or issue, what is that actually really like? What's the integrity of it in the authenticity and getting it down to the detail. Um, so you know, I find it incredibly uh, uplifting because of that um, and the ability to know that um, kind of through entertainment, this is the, these messages are reaching um, you know, audiences that might not otherwise be picking up and reading reports um, or um, you know, or, or be in the room, uh, kind of the room where it happens when we have world leaders together. That's obviously diplomacy and the rest of it has an extraordinarily important place. Um, and as does reports and all the rest and, and research and, and what's happening in the field. But the notion of the ability to kind of take these stories, take these issues, make them compelling and engaging, um, kind of the, the pill in the applesauce type of thing on some level. But um, so uh, I've just been incredibly, uh, you know, it's privileged to be able to be part of it. And, well, and, and to climb it on all the issues that it is. Yeah, and I think that what both of these series prove is that it's very entertaining to be really uncomfortable while you're watching something. And, um, and of course, what, what Norman did with, with actually putting social messaging and true issues within comedy it's great that there is that balance. Like we had, we, we had um, an, M, an Emma Award winner this year, Blackish for a sitcom, and it was about the first Earth Day. And that is sort of another way, like there's so many ways to educate. And that was a beautiful way to educate it because it was about a young girl in high school. And that is, I think you need both in order to reach the audience that you are looking for, because we're always looking for the audience that won't tune in to something that if they know that that it's strictly you know the red meat of the issue, right. um, I have a question for everyone. Um, since at Emma, our mission is to educate and to to motivate authentic choices for sustainable and climate related issues. When you're working on projects like Chernobyl and Handmaid's Tale, do you feel more of a responsibility um, to to motivate? Um, your audience to actually take action and have culpability um, after seeing your projects? You clearly did in choosing them, but do you feel, what are you trying to get your audience to sort of subconsciously do after watching? Dorothy? Craig, okay. you go. Uh, I mean, I, I think, you know, something that Craig said that really struck with me is, is the idea of being able to look truthfully at yourself and how how painful and uncomfortable that is and how we don't want to do it um and how we we're very you know it's delightful to look you know unsparingly at somebody else but it's very unpleasant to look unsparingly at yourself so i i think my hope for somebody watching handmaid's tale is that they are able to look at themselves and whatever their community is with a pretty cold eye um and and I'll just go ahead and say, I think that extends to sort of 
conventional environmentalism and the environmental movement as well. I, I think we can be, you know, excited by and proud of the things that are successes, but I also feel like, you know, it's not only backpacks, like, like there, there have been failures and there have been, um, you know, choices made, uh, you know, I started paying attention to climate stuff as a teenager. And when I look back on sort of how we all were talking in the nineties, I'm like, Ooh, that was a, that was a missed opportunity. Um, so I, I, you know, the more that we can do the kind of brutal unsparing work of self-assessment to see where we have let even our own side down or our own convictions down. Um, and I think, you know, we made the main character a very normal woman. She's not an activist. That was Margaret Atwood's choice and we've tried to stick with it. She's not somebody who sees herself as special. She is a very ordinary middle-class white lady, wife, mom, you know, goes to Whole Foods, goes to yoga, lives her life. And I think, um, the more that we can see, you know, everybody is a part of these things and things are happening even when you're not paying attention to them. And maybe we can all be more aware and, you know, even more, even more critical of our own complacency. That's, right. that's the goal. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't necessarily think that I think about the goal when I'm doing the work because I probably guessing this is the same for for Dorothy and everybody that works on um handmaids that that if you if you lead with that you, you start to turn yourself into propaganda um you become an advertising campaign and um not only will that not be effective because people will smell the inauthenticity of it but um it will also be bad television yeah uh, because yeah it's a tremendously inefficient form of an yeah. op-ed. Like if you yeah. want to write an op-ed, write an op-ed. Exactly. Write an op-ed. And you don't have a production budget. Like we're trying right. to make a story. We're trying to make what it we, with characters. What, and that's, that's the thing that we can do that, that the propaganda can't do. And the thing that I do think about when I'm writing uh, these things is about my hero. And very specifically, how can I get somebody who may normally want to side with delusion. I'll just call it delusion. We can call it denialism, we call it whatever it is, it doesn't matter. How can I get them to agree with my hero and see themselves in my hero? Even if my hero is, for instance, a woman who disagrees with them on every other issue and who is acting in a way that they might not act. And part of that means making heroes that are human and flawed, uh, none of us, uh, who go into these things should be saints. Nobody, nobody uh, is, and particularly if you are on the left and you're looking at something that is coming from the right, or you're on the right, you're looking at something from the left, and you see somebody who is just perfect, you're going to roll your eyes. Um, none of us are. And uh, if you don't acknowledge how compromised and flawed we are every single day, we are having, for instance, a conversation about the environment using our computers, which are built on raw earth materials that have been mined in Africa um, in ways that have been uh, disastrous and exploit exploitive of the people who live there. And, and if we don't mention this, somebody will. <laughs> and if we don't acknowledge it, somebody will. It's like every time they have a climate conference, somebody points out how they flew there. <laughs> and, and so it goes, and they're right. So part of what we can do is embrace the messiness of trying to improve things. We are not perfect, nor will we ever be. We can do better. We have no choice. We either do better or we die. So we can either be people that change our minds. Uh, you know, I look at two, from, from our recent, if I were writing a story now about COVID, one of the stories I would probably, I would do an episode about Chris Christie and Herman Cain side by side. You know, here's one person that got COVID and went into the hospital and almost died and came out and said, Right, I was super wrong. <laughs> and everybody, please listen to me when I tell you I was like you and I'm super wrong. I made mistakes and I'm wrong. And the other one dies and his family continues to say, masks, what? Now, choose. But this is how we move forward, not by pushing, I think, through our work, these kind of, and I, you know, 
Handmaid's Tale does it gorgeously. Uh, everybody's compromised. And, and I like that they're also acknowledging that there's a certain dangerous utopianism. Uh, we, we pursue this sort of beautiful dream of what the future could be. I, I've said many times that if you want to reduce carbon emissions and you want to uh, combat climate change, more nuclear power, but do it safely. <laughs> so you see, this is tricky. This is a tricky thing. And I, I think our stories can uh, get to the mess and the inherent contradiction better than the op-ed. Yeah, and, and you know, everything is soil and green, right? Like it's all made of people. Like any <laughs> system, any- I may really steal that, that's amazing. <laughs> everything is soil and green. But like it, like like there, there is no political party that's not made up of humans. There is no church that's not made up of humans. There is no, you know, company that's not made like all of us are so messed up. And then you put a lot of us together and we make something and the thing will be messed up because we are messed up. And that is just how it is. Um, so there, you know, as long as your building blocks are human beings, you know, that's going to be a limitation um, that I think we can just be a, be aware of and try to, you know, think about how to be smart about um, not and not go, well, once we fix people, you know, then. <laughs> then yeah, we're not thinking. Up, we've got, I just, I actually have many more questions I want to ask you, but um, we're running, we're running towards our time. What advice would you give for filmmakers who are approached with projects that have a strong climate change or sustainability, environmental issue, content, how, what kind of advice would you give them approaching this kind of um, material? Um, Dor oh. Craig, why don't you jump in real quick? Uh, I would say to be um, suspicious. Uh, I'm suspicious of everything, particularly agenda-driven art. I think art can uh, advance a cause, but as we said, it's hard to advance a cause when you're coming at it from the point of view of advancing a cause. At the very least, if you're looking at material that is has a, a, a climate message, um, look for a way for that to be the subtext. Um, in documentary, of course, it can be text. But right. if you're going to make a show about climate change, um, it's going to feel messagey. And um, one of the reasons why um, sometimes people will come to me and say, well, do you want to do a story about something that's happening right now? I mean, COVID, for instance, or anything like that. And mostly what I keep thinking is what I want to do is tell a story from the past that is not about climate change or that is not about truth denial or anything, and yet is, so that we can see that there is this line that it not only is it currently uh, all soil and green, it's always, always been soil and green, and it will end everything. We can look back and say, uh, it appears as if, for instance, um, a story about how our country was brought together initially, it can also be about climate change. If you tell it from the right point of view, which is to say that people sat around, came up with a solution and just ignored a big part of it. Like, oh, the earth is getting warmer or, oh, we are uh, owning human beings. Well, let's just move that over here <laughs> going forward. It's all about the same thing, right? So trying to come at these things from other ways and, and, and letting people unearth their own truth. I, I didn't mention climate change in Chernobyl. Nobody was even aware of climate change in Chernobyl, but everybody who watched it or nearly everybody came back and said, this is about climate change. And it's, uh, it's about a number of things, but they didn't miss it. So that's, that would be my advice. I love that. Dorothy? Yeah, I think for me, it would be you're always telling a story about relationships. Um, and so whatever other events are happening, climate is going to impact those relationships. So if it's a grandfather realizing that every winter growing up, he skated on a pond and every winter his son skated on a pond and the pond doesn't freeze anymore. And now his grandson will never skate on that pond. That is not a loss like a glacier collapsing but for that family, for that grandfather, that is the biggest loss imaginable. For all the grandfathers, and that's what you're, I love that you're bringing that up because it's all about the personal effects. 
Exactly. So it's, 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 what does it do to someone to have it dawn on them that when their grandchild was born, they imagine their grandchild skating on this pond and it just doesn't freeze. Right. And, and that's just, that's a loss and that's a grief story, but it's embedded within a family and it's embedded within the particularities of who that grandfather is and who the grandson is. And, you know, it's, it's only telling a tiny story of a tiny family, but making all of those details and specifics really real. I, I would be more sad watching that than I would be watching, you know, a giant tsunami go into a building full of a bunch of CGI people I've never met and have them all fall into the sea, right. you know, okay. They're, they're I like the idea of CGI people you've never met. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I mean? Like, like in like the yeah. adventures, like you don't even meet yeah. any guys in the things. Like there's oh, like, yeah. I these are, so, so these scenes are like that was so eloquently and perfectly said. Yeah. I think we're running over time. You guys are amazing oh, sorry. forever. Um, but I think we want to get to our next panel. So thank you so much. Um, thank you so much. And I want to introduce now uh, Robert Rickberger, who is the president of Final Mation Studios, founder and co-executive director of the SIE Society, and the partner of the Artists Group for our next panel about nonfiction and, di and documentaries. Thank you so much, Debbie. Um, yeah, really fascinating conversation about uh, fiction um, and, and climate change. And um, uh, to shift over to documentaries, it's my pleasure to, to welcome Louis and, and Jeff Orlowski. And um, uh, uh, Louis's background is that he was the director of um, the Game Changers, the Cove and Racing Extinction. And, uh, and Jeff Orlowski, uh, first with Chasing Ice, then Chasing Coral, um, and his film that's out now, uh, The Social Dilemma. Um, gentlemen, thanks so much for, for joining. Um, what, what really, I think, sets the two of you apart, and, um, and I really do mean the two of you, is that uh, you're kind of a different breed of filmmaker um, in that, um, and I'll, I'll let you respond here, but um, in that not only are you looking for impact, but you also have measurable impact. Um, uh, Jeff, do you maybe want to start? Can you talk about uh, one of your films and the sort of measurable impact that it's had? Uh, sure. Well, uh, thanks so much, Rob. Uh, great to see you, Louis. Um, I'm just blown away by this, the conversation today and, and so thankful for the panelists and the conversations that have happened. Um, uh, I, I think as sort of as Craig was mentioning, um, when you work in the documentary nonfiction space, you're working very heavily in themes and, and thinking through like the, the subject matter as the text itself and, and what you're trying to tackle. And often cases, I think, with both Louis' work and our work and, and countless other filmmakers, um, you you spend so much time thinking about the problem, you want to actually work towards the solutions as well. And what do those solutions look like? And how do you get that message embedded in the filmmaking? But then how do you follow that up with real world action? Um, so our team, our company is called Exposure Labs. And one of the big things that we've always focused on is um, what, do you, what can you do after the film has been made? Um, quite honestly, I think this for us has come from being at countless film festivals and Q and A's and everybody just asking, so what can I do? So what can I do? So what can I do? And like uh, looking and searching for those answers and how can we support? These are, these are big, very complex, very complicated, challenging issues and there's no silver bullet. Um, and so whether it's like building an arsenal of tools and suggestions you can offer people, or trying to uh, create systemic change. Um, there's a whole spectrum of things that a lot of filmmakers are striving for. Uh, for some of the work, when we were releasing Chasing Ice in 2012, we followed that up with a campaign where we were strategically trying to shift one congressman on climate change. And we found one moderate Republican congressman who had been denying climate change and really just saturated this guy's district to try to get him to shift his, his stance. Um, with Chasing Coral, we were doing a campaign in the Southeast in the US, um, looking at local climate impacts, local communities. How do we bring more people into the story? How do you create a greater and a more diverse group of people who are interested in heralding climate solutions? Uh, and the same thing with our latest film, The Social Dilemma. While not at face value, it doesn't seem like it's about climate change. It goes to a lot of the same themes that we've been talking about that our society has been so polarized on countless issues, climate being one of the biggest issues that we are extremely polarized on. Um, and how do we build consensus to move towards solutions? Um, so that's been something that we've been, we've been doing a lot of thinking around. How can we use the, the follow-up and the opportunities after the film is out there to see the change that we're hoping to envision? Thank you, Louis. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, 
we intentionally try to make films to, you know, to entertain and also to change the world. And, you know, I've, I've always kind of joked that like, you know, when you see it like a, a, a normal Hollywood film, if you can say that, is that you know, I always likened it to a roller coaster where you, you start out, your heart rate goes up and you land pretty much back at the same place. But I like to think that when we're making a film, I always said that you're changing the DNA of a person that they come back and the world looks differently. And I said this because of the, you know, the, the feedback that we've got, the intention, but uh, I'm doing a film right now uh, with the Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu. And the Dalai Lama set some scientists that work on the dysfunctional brain depression off to, to say, well, like you've been working on this, you know, what's wrong, why don't you work on what's right? And I was interviewing this researcher about two weeks ago, uh, Richie Davidson from the University of Madison, Wisconsin. And he, he talked about this idea of neuroplasticity. And he says, it only takes 90 minutes to permanently change, change somebody's brain, not the way that they think, but the way it's wired. You can hardwire a brain differently in 90 minutes. And that's like exactly the sweet spot for a documentary. So I think there's, a, there's, a, uh, there's some real scientific justification for it that there's, you know, a sweet spot. I think that, you know, it's not just about giving people information and it's not just about the emotions. It's about sort of constructing a, an argument almost of the, you know, the contradictions so that when people come out of the film, they are looking at the world differently. And you look at, you know, when we did the Cove, you know, if you haven't seen the Cove, it's a, it's a film about a dolphin slaughter. And, you know, we use those same sort of, you know, Rolling Stone said it was a cross between the Born Identity and Flipper. Um, but we use the sort of Hollywood techniques to change the way people think. People come out of that movie and you're not just thinking about dolphins in captivity differently. You're thinking about, you know, the, the animals that you put on your plate for food. You're thinking about uh, the zoos that you saw as a child differently. You're thinking that, you know, what, a, you know, we've opened up the, the world to a possibility to people that, that, there, there's, there could be another reality out there. There could be another way of being. And, you know, the, when we started that film, they were killing about 23,000 dolphins and porpoises every year in Japan for human consumption. And I think in 2017, one of the last years they had, you know, a tally, I think they killed 1,610. So it's like a 93% drop in dolphin deaths. And we don't talk about the sentience and, and intelligence of of dolphins when we talk to, let's say, the Japanese public, which is where most of this is happening. We talk about mercury poisoning. It's the way that, you know, because uh, dolphins are toxic. Dolphin meat is toxic, not just a little bit, but a lot. They need more from five to 5,000 times more mercury than allowed by Japanese law if it was a fish. Of course, these are mammals, so they get an exemption. Um, so that was, you know, one real world uh, difference. When we did racing extinction, we did these um, public, you know, we thought, well, if people are going to see, you know, a lot of people are going to see the film on Discovery when it comes out, but you're, we're trying to reach this 10% uh, of the population, not just of the America, but 10% of the population of the world, which is about, you know, 750 million people. We thought, well, for the documentary, we're never going to do that. The, it was a su pretty successful documentary on, on uh, Discovery when it came out. I think 36 million people saw it in 220 countries and territories the first day. But I knew we were never going to reach that number. So, but we did these huge public events with endangered species on the Empire State Building. We had 939 million media views, a lot, but not really enough to, 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 to reach that number. And uh, we thought, well, that, that was pretty successful. We stopped New York in its tracks like it was an Easter parade. Then about a month later, we got a call from the Pope's office and the Pope wanted to project endangered species on the Vatican during COP21. And then we had... Uh, <laughs> I think there was 225,000 people watching that event live in St. Peter's Square. Um, we had 600 media there. And of course, everybody has a cell phone and they become a broadcasting you know, uh, network themselves. And we had, I think, four and a half billion media views on that, on that event in, in like in a week. And the real world metrics are that, you know, I'm calling from, uh, from California and, you know, four the four Western states Right after that, we worked on laws that were passed to protect the most endangered species that were coming into the United States through, uh, for, through U.S. ports. So all four Western states, Oregon, Washington, California, Hawaii, enacted laws after that. There's other, I mean, we can talk about other, you know, other things that happened, but those are some simple things I can, I can point to. When we came out with the Game Changers, you know, one metrics that, 
you know, Hollywood people say, what's the box office? How many people saw it? And, you know, like, that's not our metric. It's like, how many, you know, how many fucking eyeballs did you put on and change the, the hearts and minds and the DNA of the way that people think? And the first 30 days, uh, The Game Changers, which is a film about plant-based super athletes. The first 30 days that was on Netflix, uh, searches for plant-based diet went up 350% worldwide. So, you know, I would tell investors, if you want to, if you want to make money at a dock, you know, your odds are better in Vegas, but if you want to change the world, you know, probably come to Jeff and I. <laughs> Certainly. <laughs> uh, I want to follow, if, Rob, if I could just follow up on please, one thing please. that you were saying, Louis, just tying it into the past conversation too, because you were saying like, in some ways you're making an argument, right? You're thinking through what is the argument? I, I'm, I'm just reflecting on in the narrative world, as Dorothy was saying, it's an inefficient way to make an op-ed in a series. And yet I, I'm, I'm sitting here because I feel like our job in many cases, Louis, is to write an op-ed in a movie format. And it is inefficient in some ways, but, uh, but that's, I, I feel like that is in many cases, like we spend this time researching a subject, trying to become an expert in a subject, distilling that in and sharing that back to make a case. And here's the case around the, the conclusion of years worth of thinking and research and talking to experts and uh, the best insights that we've been able to see and tap into and, and learn from. And this is a case that we want to share with the world. Um, and I think of that uh, in some ways, I mean, it depends on the different style of documentary and what you're trying to make, but there's a logical argument that you're setting up um, that hopefully leads uh, the viewer to a particular conclusion. Um, or uh, in many ways, it might just open up a lot of questions and leave the audience um, asking questions and reflecting on how do they feel having learned all of that. Um, but there are just so many different styles that you can that you can strive for when uh, when making a piece, whether fiction or nonfiction. Certainly, and um, I mean one thing that you you mentioned briefly before, and and is a big part of your your current doc, uh, the social dilemma, is sort of being in these bubbles, um, and yeah. eff effectively how to reach people who aren't yeah. part of the choir. Um, I, I remember Jeff when when Chasing Ice came out. Um, the, the video that this woman posted after seeing the film mm -hmm. and saying, I used to, you know, kick people out of my house if they believe in right. climate change. I'm yeah. so sorry. This film just completely changed my life. What, what are you both right. doing in the construction and the, the end of the film to make sure that the people that are challenging and need to be converted are, are seeing it and, and being receptive yeah. to it? Well, this is, it's a, it's a really, uh, great point that you're bringing up here, Rob. And I think this is one of the reasons why we ended up making the social dilemma in the first place. And I'll, I'll just share a little backstory and, and the, the parallels here. Um, we were taking Chasing Ice and Chasing Coral all around the country, going to film festivals, going on tour, and we would still meet people who were denying climate change. This is like mid 2010s, 2017, still finding climate denialism. And you're like, we're, we've met all the scientists. We know what's going on. We can like, Louie and I can argue whatever point, right? And talk to any skeptic, but we're there do, on this on a one-on-one -on -one basis, what have you. And like, just constantly blown away by how are people getting such completely different information? How are our politicians so ignorant of the reality of the science? How are we politically unable to act on a massive pressing global need when, when uh, politicians are just using the argument that, oh, my constituents don't think it's real. Oh, I don't have the political support to change the stance. I don't like, that's the, the reality that we've been in for the last several years. And the question just kept coming into my mind, like how are we so divided in the information that we get? There was a, a TED talk that came out and I think in 2011, Eli Pariser did a talk on filter bubbles. And he broke down how algorithms and how computers are just actually literally feeding different people di different information. And one of the things that went off for me as a light bulb was this realization that, I, I mean, I, I went to Stanford, all my friends worked in tech in Silicon Valley, friends at Facebook, Google, Twitter, all, all of those companies. We all loved those companies and had this really positive mindset of what they could bring to the world. And obviously they can be used as great tools for amplification of great causes but they can also be tools to amplify misinformation. They can be misused. And the, there are algorithms that are inherently built into these systems that are filtering out information that each and every one of us, every one of us see. Um, one of our subjects references this as, we live in 2.7 billion Truman shows, which everybody get, getting their own personalized Truman show. And, and the, the reala realization for me was, I mean, I can watch every single one of Louis's movies, a bunch of my friends, we can all see these stories. We can watch every single environmental film that's come out. And yet there is 
parallel to that, another universe where people haven't seen any of those stories. They're not hearing those stories. They're completely unaware because there's an algorithm feeding them different information. So from my perspective, this is where the narrative storytelling is really effective. This is where creative new ideas and ways to tell stories is really effective because we need to figure out ways to break the mold to get more and more people to come into the conversation, to find different ways where somebody might stumble across something and be interested and engaged. It isn't following necessarily the same script of a traditional environmental documentary. Um, with all the love that I have for David Attenborough and, and BBC, that is a particular type of audience that will go and watch that particular type of show and um, I, I love the work, but how do we find something that will resonate with a different audience that never watches that type of show, right? I think, Lou, your example of, you know, Born Identity meeting Flipper, like you want to find the audience that's going to watch uh, that movie or an audience that's going to watch the military or the athlete story. So finding different access points in so that we can broaden and make a more inclusive conversation with a lot of different audiences. That's where I think we need to continue continuously challenge ourselves as storytellers um, and to look for and search for those stories that as, as Craig was saying earlier, um, how can climate be the subtext of a narrative? How can these ideas and themes be embedded in our society so people are hearing them and realizing them all the time, um, not just in a specific climate doc, but in lots of content everywhere? Yes, cer certainly. And and Louis, in in you know Game Changers, I mean that's a film about ultimate, you know, uh, narrated by an ultimate fighter about MMA. I mean that is uh, one of the biggest ways, you know, that we can affect climate change is to change our, our diet. You know, it has so many impacts on so many different layers of, 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 of the globe and environmentalism. Uh, was that a conscious choice to make that story sort of directed at an audience and sort of put the environmental side as like a small little window in, in the, the whole piece? Or, I mean, what, what are the things you're doing to sort of reach across to people that aren't, aren't Pretty yeah, nice. in, a, in a way, I, I had a, a very similar experience that, that Jeff had when he came out with Ch Chasing Ice, like what people say, what can you do? And what we, I did a film about that same time called Racing Extinction. And, um, you know, people say, what can you do? And you think, well, you know, I'm a, I'm a, a vegan. I've been for, you know, I don't know, I, I didn't have like a start date, 10, 12 years. Um, but it's been, a, unfortunately, a very slow, gradual path. But like when you start looking at the data for climate change, it's, you know, the raising of meat for human consumption is, you know, one of the, the largest, you know, things for uh, contributors for, you know, for greenhouse gases. It's the, the biggest cause of species extinction, the biggest cause of habitat destruction, the biggest cause of freshwater pollution. One of the, uh, I'm here at Dean Ornish's office right now. Uh, it's, it's, he's reversing Alzheimer's with, Partly part of this program is a, is a whole foods plant-based diet. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the 80 to 85 percent of the of the chronic diseases we have can be reversed by what we put in our bodies. Other things too, like you know, more exercise, more social interaction, real social interaction. Um, but then, a, you know, a light bulb went off in my head. It's like, well, why don't we, we have to make a film about you know a plant-based diet, but how are you going to do it? How are you going to make it so not just vegans are doing it? Because we, and we looked at the data, the data shows that about 7% of the population, if you say the world's falling apart because of what's on your plate, only 7% of the people that get that message will change. 93% of the world doesn't care. Yeah. So how do you reach that, you know, that, that group? And we, we did a, there was a white paper that was done and we studied it and it said that the, the, the biggest impediment was men because men are marketed too heavily. So even if a woman becomes vegetarian or vegan and cooks a meal, the guy says, where's the meat? You know, then, you know, then it becomes an argument and then they slowly gravitate over towards, you know, eating meat again. So men are the, the obstacle, but the, the same white paper said, well, men will look at aspirational people, athletes. So we took the, you know, world's, one of the world's strongest men by the definition of carrying more weight further than anybody's ever done in history. And Scott Jurek, who lives in Boulder, where Jeff is, where I used to live, uh, one of the most accomplished ultra runners, he runs hundred miles for, you know, like that's easy. And we, had, we, we documented him running the Appalachian Trail as 2,200 miles, that's 46 days of almost two marathons a day. So you've, you know, when, when men come back, well, where are you gonna get the strength? What, look what the world's strongest guy eats, you know, plants. But look at what the, the most, for endurance, look at what the most accomplished ultra runner does, eats plants, you know. And we interviewed two of the top 10 boxers at that time, and both of them were vegans. And one of them said, well, 
we don't want we don't want our competitors to know because it gives us an edge. <laughs> but, you know, but but the, the whole way that we marketed to men was on health, and then that was yep. like that was you know Act Three. You know, at the we say well, and by the way, it's killing the planet. And so once you've constructed the argument that the optimum um, diet for strength, nutrition, uh, endurance, virility is plants, then you've, then, it, then it's like, oh, there's all these other benefits. You're not, you know, melting the coral reefs. You're not, you know, destroying this habitat. Oh, you know what? I, I do care about an endangered species now because, you know, I'm having a positive impact. One thing we found is that once people, once you construct an ar argument to make positive changes that infects them personally, because we're really kind of selfish people, you know, just by, just do the data, just, just do the research. We will act mostly on you know our own self-interest you know so if you you know by cater by by instead of making a, a film that makes us feel good and one that was effective we're changing the world way more because we're reaching that other 93 percent of the audience and louis to that point i mean uh game changers was such a great film to point people to to the conservative friends and family to the truck drivers to whatever like to people i've been trying to reach with an environmental message for a long time it gave a totally different tool and a totally different angle. Um, and I think it's that, that personal aspirational element that is a really compelling, like how do I improve my own health, my own life, my own well-being, my own um, physical prowess. Um, that was a really, really effective way to just say, hey, look, here's another movie you can watch and let me know what you think. Yeah, oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, I, I mentioned this to, to Louis previously that I was speaking with a um, very prominent documentarian uh, after the Emmys and said, we we're talking about social impact entertainment and he said you know filmmakers really shouldn't chase impact um and louis response was you know well with everything going on in the world how can you not do that how can you not make films that, that seek to change the world um through each of your your journeys and, and jeff you first has there been a moment where you were surprised about the magnitude of of the impact of, of, of film Spe specifically your I, film or I, other films um uh was I surprised? It's a great question. I'm not really sure. Um, I think the as as I think Louis and I both agree. Like in many cases, and certainly in the nonfiction space, there is a, a, a deeply embedded impact goal. Um, in the in the fictional space, as, as the earlier panelists were talking about, there's a different need and structure around story. But for me, I, I'd want to work on a, a fictional narrative project that has important societal themes in it. And I do believe that is what many artists are aspiring aspiring for that might not be what all producers are aspiring for and all financiers and there's a different structure and breakdown between like the part of the industry that's looking to capitalize and make money off of a product versus the part of the industry that's trying to say something and get ideas out into the world and and hope that the ideas are going to shift society so um uh for me um there, I can't like the too long of a list of in anecdotes and moments and experiences where you know somebody sees the film and it cracks through and and it shifts the way somebody thinks about an issue um, or changes their experience or relationship and, and their thinking. I think that's uh, for me at least that is very much the goal and the hope and, and the ambition. Hmm. Thank you, Louis. Yeah, any, well, any particular I mean, moments that really just kind of shocked you? Well, you know, like I, you know, like I said, there's there's some really good science that shows that once 10% of the population it, it has a hundred percent committed to the idea of change, you know, like like on a plant-based diet or climate change, then it's almost unstoppable. You know, if you look at a a picture of I think it was the 1900, the year 1900 Easter parade in New York City, and it was taken from a, a building to, on Broadway, looking down, it was like all horses one car you know, it'd be like like find Waldo like find the find the car and then you can imagine what everybody in that those horses those horse drawn buggies are thinking like who's that crazy guy over there but remember you know that was I mean, we think of oh horses that was such an idyllic era but there was like 20,000 tons of manure dropped on the streets every day you were dry you were you know dragging crap into your business your, your home your office it's the sailors said you could smell New York six miles out and um, you know, sixty thousand gallons a year and being dumped on the streets, it stunk. It stunk. It was full of diseases. And so, ten years later, there's a picture done of the Easter Parade. It was actually 1913, and it was the opposite. It was like all cars find the horse. And these changes happen very quickly in like ten to 
12 year cycles. You know, 12 years ago, 13 years ago, we were punching the number two key on our flip phones six times to text a, a capital C. The world can change really quickly once people get the idea that, you know, these, you know, that there's something new and better out there. You know, I had one of the first electric cars in, in Colorado, I had three of them actually, and they were powered by solar panels, 120 solar panels. I had a fully electric Toyota RAV and the, the license plate said VUS, it stood for vehicle using the sun. It's the opposite of an SUV. And people thought I was nuts. And I would say, luckily, I don't, I don't pay for gas. I don't pay for electricity. I used to get an electric bill for $1,000 a month. Now I get checks for $600. There's a $1,600 difference there. And people thought I was crazy. And now Tesla is the, you know, is worth twice what all the US, other US companies are, are worth total. And so like what you have to look at it in this historical perspective, what Jeff and I and other people this will, will do, you just see, you're just seeing a little bit further out to the future. Yeah. And, you know, we're, I, I think these changes going to happen. It's going to be inevitable. We're trying to jumpstart it though, before it's, it's too late. You know, we're acidifying the oceans, the coral reefs that Jeff did with coral, with uh, chasing coral are dissolving. We lost like, I don't know, Jeff knows the statistic better than me, but like over 50% of the coral reefs have yeah. been died in the last, in the last couple of years. years yeah. and these are like big, huge changes. It's not just pretty little reef fish. I mean, that's, it, it's, 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 it's uh, what's happening to the oceans. We're supported by the oceans. Two out of every three breaths we take are, support, are supported by the oceans. They, plankton generates far more oxygen than all the land plants in the world. And we lost about 40% of plankton production in the last 50 years. So we're not just saying, look at the pretty little reef fish. We're looking at, this is our life support system. Right. And the idea that people say, well, we, don't, you know, we shouldn't be using our, you know, our creative forces for positive good. Are you joking me? I mean, come on, we're, we're losing life as we know. We're burning the Library of Congress before we had a chance to read the books. I mean, yeah. so I mean, so we're just a little bit ahead of the of the outcome. But there, listen, there's business that is there. You know, like when we came out with uh, the Game Changers, uh, Pat Brown from Impossible said we, you know, we said his stock, you know, was was you know, people are you, you can see when the film came out weeks later, the jump in you know their, the demand for the product went up. Uh, yeah. we, 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 that one film created billions of dollars. I'm not joking, billions of dollars of revenue for plant-based businesses all over the world. You know, it didn't make us a lot of money, but you know, the, the other way to look at this too is that we're just changing the world. Every single person that you change to a whole food plant-based diet, let's look at the, the consequences. The average person eats 10,000 animals in their lifetime. You know, so there's 10,000 animals, if you care about animal rights, that are not going through a liposophony. You save three and a half tons of, three and a half to four tons of carbon dioxide per year. You're saving um, 1,000 gallons of fresh water. You know the list goes on. So every single person that sees that film and changes, they become part of that army. You know, to, so we can get to that 10% number and you know change the world. And you know, I think we're you know we're probably about you know the the UN right now has this decade of action. We have 10 years to solve climate change. So I'm you know we're we're part of that, you know, the generals on that army, you know, trying to change the world, try to get enough people on board so we can, you know, leave, you know, like the, the other panels we're talking right before this. It's like, yeah, it's really sad that you can't, you know, skate on the pond like your grandfather did. But, you know, what if there's no fish below it? What if you can't breathe fresh air? What if, you know, there's a lot of downstream consequences that happen um, that are emotional, but also just the physical things that we're doing to the planet are, are, are irreparable. You know, you can't and core reefs back easily after you've destroyed them. Yeah. And those impacts that are happening so disproportionately, um, which is uh, fortunately, it's a growing and growing part of the conversation that more people are recognizing um, the asymmetric distribution of, of the consequences of climate. Um, all the more reason the way we need to take faster action. Certainly. Uh, well, well um, you know, Heidegger has a quote about what, what makes a masterpiece a masterpiece. And, and he says, you know, it, it, it um, uh, brings together the culture and allows it to uh, articulate what it's feeling and, and bask in its light. And certainly the films that, that um, the, the two of you have made and brought a lot of people together and um, have had a significant impact. So I'm going to transition over to, um, to Will next, but um, uh, Nick, awesome. if you want to stay for the Q&A. Um, but yeah, thank, thanks a ton for the, the conversation. Thanks so much, Rob. Yeah, appreciate it. Thanks, Lee.
So, so next up is um, uh, William Nix, who will be leading our Q&A. Uh, will is a, a colleague and friend of mine at um, the PGA Social Impact Entertainment Task Force and also a co-executive director uh, with me at um, uh, SIE Society. Uh, will, take it away. Well, there you're on mute. Yes, okay, thank you for uh, the, the lead in and what an amazing group of panelists uh, we've had uh, leading up to this part of the, uh, the session. Um, I'm going to try and pivot and I think you know one of the things that would be useful uh, is to get back to sort of the storytelling process. Uh, and uh, so I think with that in mind, uh, let's, uh, let's look at this in terms of uh, you know, the conceptualization, the production, the marketing release, and then the impact measurement and assessment. And while you know, on the first part of it, while it's not Heidegger, there's a, a sort of industry term about inserting the spinach in with the popcorn. And I think that's a lot about what we're trying to do with social impact entertainment is to you know, grab people's attention uh, and really uh, focus them uh, in a way that they're engaged, uh, they're motivated, they're inspired, and then uh, we want them to actually take action and convert it uh, in some way or other. So um, maybe starting just with that process part of it uh, and uh, specifically, uh, Andy, with what you have done uh, in your collaboration, could you talk a little bit about your role with The Handmaid's Tale in uh, working with Dorothy and sort of how you came into that from the UN perspective uh, as a resource uh, and whatever, and then we'll sort of follow on with others. Sure, sure. Thanks. Thanks, Will. Um, so the UN, um, as been mentioned, has a has a, an initiative called Creative Community Outreach Initiative, who's, um, and the goal of that is to really to match experts and be able to provide expertise. Um, so people have been in the field, people who uh, know the subject matter, people who have, um, uh, you know, sat across from from those people that are are, are living these realities every day, um, and match them with you know showrunners, producers, directors, writers, um, the, the talent, the you know actors, um, and really be able to provide that expertise. And so it started, you know, sometimes everything from just you know, can you read this and tell us does it feel accurate? Does it feel does it have kind of authenticity and and and, uh, and, and integrity? The 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 script. Um, uh, or the sets or the costumes or the the dialogue. Um, but also I think, so that's kind of how, how this has started. And I think that um, again, what's been amazing about The Handmaid's Tale is that, you know, with in, such an incredibly curious um, group of people who are so dedicated to getting the details right and mining the material. And also I think the notion of what people think may be the reality, um, you know, oftentimes from movie scenes and what the reality may be um, on the ground and uh, is, is often very different. So it's that kind of questioning. So it'd be, uh, it, it ended up being, you know, almost kind of embedded in some level into the, into the writer's room and being able to have the opportunity to spend time there to be able to, um, at the beginning of the season and the last few seasons sit down um, as uh, the group was really beginning to plot out what would happen and what the storylines would be and what would be the, the development of the characters and, and the, again, different plot points and just having these kind of discussions and sometimes it'd be, you know, the beginning of the day through the end of the day over a few days. Um, and, and, you know, the idea is like, Dorothy, you, you guys are always, we always say you're the creatives, you know where you need to take the story and how you want to take the story, but asking these incredible questions about what this would really be like. And, you know, I think we've been really fortunate in that a number of times there's been kind of through these conversations, unexpected uh, moments or discussions that have, have led to um, there being development of characters of, of plot points. I don't know, Dorothy, if you want to speak a little bit about that, but that's kind of that process that we- I was going to ask about that. It's, you know, sometimes uh, experts uh, are more welcome than other times in terms of the writer's room and getting, sort of being embedded that way. What was like, obviously this seems to have been a very uh, a collegial and uh, productive experience between you. What, what uh, can you tell us about that? Yeah, um, I mean, I, I think so much of what we, are looking for is to try to follow um, that guideline that we got from Margaret Atwood of, you know, not not inventing when we could have things that are that are real. And so um, we'll have demands on the storytelling that will always, you know, twist and turn it um, from location to you know costumes to um, 
space and time, you know, all kinds of things. We're not, we're not making a documentary. We are making a work of fiction, but if we can get, um, you know, everything from, you know, what is the vocabulary that's used in this exchange? Um, that can be a really useful starting point. And then we can look at that and either go like, wow, this is perfect. Let's just lift it. Um, or mm, this is a little long. This is a page and a half. We need it to be about, you know, a quarter of a page, but what's the, what's useful to us? What's the essence um, for us? Um, so, so some of it is that sort of fact checking. And then some of it is also just, you um, getting at the, at the complex humanity of people that, um, you know, people in refugee situations aren't, a, a, you know, perfect angels. Everyone responds to displacement differently. It's an emotionally complicated process and being open to hearing stories of people who um, experienced, you know, their refugee time in a million different ways um, gives us a million different uh, paths, you know. Yeah. So often we'll come to Andy with a question and be like, is it A or B? And she'll be like, well, it's A and it's also B and it's also W and it's also banana. Um, and that's great. Like we, we now have more options um, instead of things being narrowed down, they're kind of opened up um, because people, people are complicated and they don't respond like robots um, to, to complicated situations. Thank you. And, and Cassie, you, you had mentioned before the, uh, uh, the situation with refugees and uh, the, the reality of climate change. I mean, a lot of what has been experienced in terms of uh, uh, both the refugee crisis and, and emigration, as well as warfare in the Middle East, is very much tied to certain origins with climate change and drought and whatever. Uh, in, in terms of your, your working and sort of working with producers and writers and directors and whatever, uh, how do you uh, do you reach out to them? Do they come to you, or what is your process uh, for getting engaged that way? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah, it, it, it's 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 varied. Sometimes uh, they uh, they have reached out. Sometimes also through through the UN. A lot of what Andy was talking about that you know the UN really does want to be a partner in this process. That uh, yes, that the 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 working with filmmakers and storytellers and um, and, and being able to help complement that and, and feed that with our experiences from, from what's going on around the world. And sometimes when I, when I am sitting in writer's rooms, we will just have a conversation about um, some of the details that, that need to sort of feed into a, to a scene. And I remember talking about climate refugees with one television show and I kind of casually mentioned, oh, the average time someone is in a refugee camp is 17 years. And so this is something that your, their whole life is shaped by this experience. And it was from that that then we started having a conversation about, well, what does it mean to have your formative years in a, in a place like a refugee camp? And how does that influence the decisions that you make um, in, in the long haul? Um, so, so what are the, you know, the practical questions that producers and people who are putting productions together have is uh, sort of how do you get funding? How do you get people behind them? Uh, and are, is there an impact investing coalition that's partnered uh, with the UN and uh, as bet between the UN and storytellers or whatever? Or, you know, is there anything that, that helps with the, the, the financial and other engines that drive actually getting these things to the screen in some way or another? Well, Maha, do you want to dive into that or? Sure. Maha, please. Yes, sure. If you, thank you. Uh, I think, unfortunately not. I mean, the UN itself is, 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 is funded through contributions by member states and to some extent recently, maybe by foundations. And, and as we see with COVID-19, WHO, the World Health Organization, uh, that is not something that is within what we can provide, uh, but sometimes collaboration on these issues can attract funding from sources that are interested in seeing global solutions. I mean, the UN is, the, the, the advantage of the United Nations is when it comes to certain issues, it is the only body that is accepted as the one with the overarching umbrella that can deal with those issues. In the same way, today, when you read in the papers that COVID-19 response in the United States requires the federal government, because no state alone or city alone can deal with this crisis, the federal government has to 
have certain interventions. The same way globally, not a single government can deal with climate change or COVID-19 or the flow of migration or refugees. That level of cooperation is needed and that's what the framework is, the United Nations. And we are, ourselves, are hampered with the issue of funding because most of our funding is coming from governments and those governments today uh, are tightening, tightening the belt because of the reductions in GDP. So many of the agencies, funds and programs are waiting to see what their bottom line is going, bottom line is going to look like in 2021 and whether the projects and ambitious agenda that we have is going to be made possible. But this is why I think the emphasis here is that it's not a United Nations agenda, it's everybody's agenda because eventually it's gonna impact your ability to, to respond, to, to have an audience that can pay for your films, whether entertaining or documentaries. And uh, I think that's, that's part of the challenge we've ha we, we, we have. Uh, there are innovative ways of funding as we have seen. And, and I think maybe that's what, what we can try to get together. Yeah. And uh, Debbie Levin, I wanted to bring in the uh, EMA on this. Uh, and I, I want to point out also the, uh, I put into the chat a number of resources, including links to the uh, Environmental Media Association and Hollywood Health and Society uh, and uh, other uh, things that relate to uh, climate telling, uh, uh, climate storytelling. Uh, and Debbie, could you talk a little bit about, you know, how producers and writers and, and directors work with the EMA and the resources you have available to them? Absolutely. There's, um, there's obviously been a huge evolution in the last 30 years of the organization. Um, I think, you know, in, in the very beginning, the resources of finding out about issues were not as readily available with the internet and with social media now exploding with issues. Um, we are able to get information out you know, in a very, very immediate way. As far as working with filmmakers, very often somebody calls us or emails us and asks us and tells us about a project that they're doing and asks us what we know about it, how to guide them to a different organization or just to try to kind of help frame the story. Um, I think that the most important thing for us as an organization is to really help tell a story, as Dorothy said before, from a, an individual family relatable point of view. And I think because there is such an incredible world of documentaries, the world of scripted, it's so important to engage people on a personal level. And I think that's the conversation that we have with a lot of filmmakers of, you know, there, there are these underlining issues in, in the concept, but they have the ability to really reflect and touch on, on something about, about the bigger picture. How do you gently kind of play that, you know, walk that tightrope of, being engaging and empathetic and relatable and also bringing it out to the bigger issue. And then of course, being very solution oriented. Um, we are very solution oriented as an organization. We try to talk in terms of positives and not the overwhelming disaster impending, if, if so to speak. So I think that really helping frame in a way that is relatable to people who might not understand. Because I think if you're looking at the audience, um, so many people tune into a show not knowing that it's going to have some kind of an underlining environmental storyline to it. That's those, those are people who may not know or don't think that they care. And then being able to bring that in and make them see a different point of view through a character that they're connected to is incredibly important. Thank you. Just quickly Thank add you. to that. Um, sure. Sure. Just, you know, and we, we talk a lot about, um, also at the UN, about the sense of, of um, you know, we sometimes say that a, a million people are statistics and one person is a tragedy. And it is this notion of, of um, how to make people care, raising, that we can raise awareness, um, but that other sense of that why care. And I think the one thing that, that uh, 
that the creative community does in entertainment has the ability to offer, whether it's through the development of a character um, or Dorothy, as you were mentioning, those those stories, the, the individual um, anecdotes or, you know, a character, whether flawed, or, you know, or not. Um, but it is that notion of um, the issue suddenly becomes, you know, personal so people can see themselves in it or they get and or they get attached to an individual character or set of characters. And then hopefully motivated to go make a change in their lives. And we've been lucky because we have the Emma Awards, which is 30 years this year. And there is a sense of competition in the, in the entertainment industry to be nominated or to win, which we love because that's something that when they come across um, an issue, a, a story that has the issue attached to it, they know that there's a platform that will be able to recognize and speak about that. And I think that's been really, really important in terms of the industry of, of having um, an organization that um, celebrates the work and celebrates it in a way that um, is, again, is integrated into the narrative without sacrificing the characters. Thank you. So Jeff, a question for you, but it's sort of a general one as well here, uh, which is the question of when we were putting this together and, and looking for examples of uh, uh, fictional dramatic sort of, uh, whether they were features or, or television series or whatever, we found on this issue of climate change, it's a relatively close set uh, that, you know, uh, with Handmaid's Tale and Chernobyl, and then we you know, look back and we saw The Impossible, we saw you know, different uh, a couple episodes from Madam Secretary. But there weren't a lot uh, you know, out of the uh, documentary sort of uh, nonfiction area. Uh, so w in looking at this as a filmmaker, I'm wondering uh, in terms of how you reach people, how you create the sort of empathy uh, that uh, we're, we're talking about here, uh, what is your sort of mindset and, and your process for going uh, you know, focusing on documentary versus looking at other uh, forms or portrayals uh, for getting the message out, if you will, and actually having a, a, the sort of impact that Louis was talking about. Um, yeah, it's a great question. And Dorothy, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this as well. I, I think in many ways, um, in my mind, it really depends on what story you're trying to tell and what's the best way to then tell that story. Um, when when we made Chasing Ice and Chasing Coral, in large part, it was because because we had access to those stories. We had access to people that were living on glaciers. We had access to people that spent all their time underwater. And we, we then learned um, in that process how we can convey those climate related stories and make a very climate centered story. Um, in the case of The Social Dilemma, our latest film, we uh, broke a lot of the molds and we made a nonfiction film that has a very, very strong narrative, uh, fictional narrative element embedded throughout it. Um, uh, I looked at um, the big short from Adam McKay as inspiration that took a complicated concept and made it accessible. I think that's the challenge of what we've spent a lot of time in in communicating science around how do you make science accessible and how, I mean, I'd love to geek out with any scientists out there about what they're studying, but recognize that's not the average person. And I look at my role as being a bridge to help convey that complexity um, and making it accessible. And so what we did for The Social Dilemma was looking at the big short uh, in some ways and saying, what's the nonfiction version of that? How do you make a documentary that you know is grounded in truth and yet make it accessible to the average person who doesn't, is not used to watching sitting heads talking you know, for an entire film? Um, so that was a, a, a tool that we were able to just leverage and use in that case to sort of tap into the best of both worlds. But it, it also rates a little bit in terms of what the media platforms that are available. Are you talking about traditional cable TV or, you know, or can you Certainly. get a theatrical release for documentaries? Uh, or are we looking at other guides, more, you know, the streaming services and, and, and right. other media channels that are available yeah. to get the word out? And I think you're getting into a massive chicken and egg between um, a particular piece of content and what's the right platform for it and who's the right audience and which distributors think that it'll, it'll resonate with their audience. Um, you know, is it a film suited for indie theaters or is it a film suited for global streaming or what have you? Um, Dorothy, do you have thoughts? Yeah, on that? I mean, I think a lot of this gets to sort of what you're getting at in the social dilemma, which is, you know, all of our media consumption is so sort of 
pre-filtered by the time we sit down to look at what's being recommended to us on Netflix or Hulu or whatever, like there's already an algorithm that's decided who we are and what it thinks we want to see <clears throat> and is only targeting more of that to us in the same way that yeah. our Facebook feed or our Twitter feed or whatever is a sort of self-fulfilling prophecy of you know, information that makes us agree more with what we already believed. Um, when you think about something like All in the Family, it took place at a time when everybody sat down and watched a show as America. And so right. you know, what Norman Lear was able to do, which is stunning to me, is make something that people could watch together and you could watch with somebody who you didn't necessarily agree with. And both of you could be like, wow, that person in that scene sure looked like an idiot. And you know, you could experience the same scene, um, but not feel like you were you were alienated or you were mocked. Um, you could you could sort of love the characters and uh, experience it collectively. Um, right. And I think it's very hard right now to come up with anything that we're all watching together, even something that we all experience together, like a national election. If you watch that election coverage on one network versus another versus another, you will literally get different numbers, like a different story as yeah. to what the result of, you know, a, a theoretically um, impartial, neutral process that involves, you know, discrete things that can be counted. Um, you're, you won't, you'll, you'll get totally different storytelling depending on how you consumed that news. So I, I think it's a huge challenge. Um, I think it's an opportunity for anybody who happens to have a platform that is currently um, large in any way, shape or form, um, if they are able to bring climate up, um, that feels like a, a gift um, and finding ways to bring that up. like. I, I don't watch like, cause I'm not watching TV in the morning, but like, you know, morning shows where like people sit around and like have coffee, like lots of people tune into those. And if there's a way that climate is a part of that, that's easier than getting a bunch of people who watch TV usually at 10 o'clock in the morning to suddenly watch a climate documentary. Right. right. Um, so, I, you know, I, someone asked me like, what would be the best climate TV show? And I was like, well, it'd be if the last episode of Modern Family was just their houses being destroyed in fires. Like, like yeah. everyone already tuned in, everyone's already watching the last episode of a popular sitcom, and then it just ends with, you know, a climate disaster in the middle of it. But nobody turned on their TV to watch a show about climate change. Um, you know, to your point on that, it, getting these environmental storylines within very popular network or I mean at this point any Netflix whatever into shows that you don't expect to see that that have a broader audience is so helpful and that's sort of the the sweet spot and a lot of um, TV producers and filmmakers definitely are inclined to want to communicate climate issues in their work but they are they're running these shows that really don't have much to do with it. So it's it's actually a credit to them that so often you'll be able to have some small storyline that really is very pointedly um, educational and and motivating and um, will really make the viewer understand that um, something that any and again like watching a specific news network where you don't expect to, to hear something and so you're you're grabbing the audience that might not have seeked out that information. So that's so valuable. So we're running up on our time, but I wanted to give Norman and uh, Lynn a chance to weigh in here uh, and see if you had any reflections and in terms of what the uh, dialogue has been in the conversation. Um, no, we just, <laughs> we were just listening and, and uh, you know, thought the conversation was great. Uh, can anybody just give us a question? There was, so good. here's your chance, everybody on the panel, uh, weigh in. What would you like to ask the lawyers? You're speechless? I just want to say thank you to you both for all the work that you've been doing for countless years and uh, just constantly inspired by the dedication and ongoing effort that you both have been putting into to all of these issues. Well, 
Thanks, Jeff. Think of it this way. We have six kids and four grandkids, and they all need a planet. <laughs> yeah. We do. Absolutely. Fascinating conversation, and we even really enjoyed listening to everybody. Um, uh, you know, I, I just think when I was talking about how at Sundance we've had so few um, environmental and certainly climate change films uh, that have been submitted, except of course, for Louis and Jeff's, and and we need more. We need a lot more. And I and I don't believe that that they wouldn't be. Want, I mean, I think there's a big audience out there for them. I think there's some myth in Hollywood that people don't want to watch these kinds of films, but there's, I think, a huge, a real demand for them. And uh, I know at Sundance we're looking for them. We want directors and filmmakers to make them and uh, they just aren't submitting them enough. So, um, so please, uh, you know, nobody should be afraid. Very good. Well, I wanna thank all of our colleagues at the UN and, and uh, our filmmaker and producer panelists and my fellow moderators. I think it's been really a wonderful uh, uh, way to spend a Saturday morning and hopefully we've inspired at least a few people uh, in attendance to wanna to go out and do exactly what Lynn said. So. Uh, have a wonderful rest of uh, your Saturday and uh, wish you a great weekend. Thank you. You too. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Bye.